The year is 1942. The location, Nazi-occupied Poland, the city of Lviv. You are a random pedestrian pulled off the street by German soldiers into the yard of a recently shelled prison. You are made to join a line of other men, backs against the wall of one burning wing of the prison. The heat of the flames like an oven. The soldiers scream and shout, but their officer is calm. To his nose, he holds a clean white handkerchief to mask the stench of burning human bodies. Gunshots sound. Out of sight on the other side of the prison wing, the firing squad you are waiting to face, executing the latest batch of victims. You never thought of your Jewish heritage until the Nazis occupied your city. Ethnic groups seemed like a thing of the past. Now you are going to die for that past. You dream of becoming a doctor of philosophy. You plan to write your thesis on pure logic. But you can't make any logical sense of why you are going to be killed now. A film crew arrives. You don't know why, but this changes the situation. The soldiers no longer care if you live or die. First cautiously, then in a panic, you flee into the city. From the ghetto of Lviv, you escape to safety. Two years later, the war ends. Piece by piece, you learn that your entire extended family were killed. Aunts, uncles, and cousins you grew up with, all gone. Six million Jews are killed in the Holocaust. But almost as soon as the crimes are done, the denials begin. You watch as those responsible and those that did nothing to stop the crime find ways to deny responsibility. You become a writer, a science fiction novelist. Your books win awards and are made into movies. They are acclaimed as great works of philosophy. Your name is Stanislav Lem. And in your stories is a secret meaning, hidden in the tales of crazy space pilots, of robot monks, and of incomprehensible alien life, is a search for the answer to one question. Why did this happen? This is a story about Stanislav Lem, one of the most significant science fiction authors of the 20th century. Lem is most famous for Solaris, filmed by Andrei Tarkovsky, his collection of fables for the future, the Siberiad, and for his Summa Technologi, the book that predicted VR and AI. But this isn't just an introduction to Lem. This is the story of Stanislav Lem's search for the truth of the Holocaust and how that search shaped perhaps the most exceptional body of work in the history of science fiction. And it's the story of why Lem fought a bitter feud with the science fiction writers of America. To tell this story, we're gonna think about many of Lem's most famous stories. Our interpretation of Lem is going to be helped by the insights of Agnieszka Gajewska and her book, Holocaust and the Stars, and by leading Lem expert, Ilana Gomel, who joins me on this journey. At the heart of this story is one of Lem's least known and most cryptic texts. It's a story that has never been translated into English. The title of the story is Provocation, and that single word is a key to understanding so much of Lem. Lem was not just a writer, Lem was also a thinker and a philosopher. He published a book called Sumet Technologia, which is about uh, philosophy of AI. And even today, it was published, I think, in the early 1960s. It's one of the most profound analysis of what AI actually is. So in a way, he was a Renaissance man. He wrote science fiction, he wrote philosophical treatises. He was born exactly 100 years ago, 1923, in Poland, actually in Lviv, which is Ukraine now. He was a Jewish, but he didn't realize it until the Nazis came. And then he was confronted with the fact of his own Jewishness. And this is one that created the sense of alienation because he writes his autobiography, he had to, so he had to pass as a Gentile in how to survive, but he had to play a role wearing a mask, which for him was his the true self, because he didn't think of himself as a Jewish, and yet it was a mask hiding his true self. Solaris 
unfortunately spoiled by um, the two horrible movies, is in my view probably the greatest science fiction book ever written because it's not about people. It's about an encounter with totally other, with the absolute other, with an intelligence with who would have nothing at all in common. And what happens to us when we're confronted with something which is totally beyond our understanding. Stanislav Lem was many different writers, five writers at least. The writer Jonathan Lefham argues that there are five Stanislav Lems. The first Lem, the writer of 20th century hard science fiction, typified by John W. Campbell's astounding magazine, writers like Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov, but with the ironic twist that Lem despised American science fiction, read Solaris, The Invincible, and many more. The second Lem was the phantasmagorical satirist who wrote fairy tales for the future, allegories of alienation and cosmic horror, including the Siberiad and the Futurological Congress. The third Lem, the metaphysical mystery writer and author of just two novels, The Investigation and The Chain of Chance. Lem number four, the pure postmodernist, deeply influenced by the stories of Borges, this Lem writes reviews of imaginary, unwritten books that include the story Provocation. And Lem number five, the essayist, futurist, literary critic, and philosopher, author of the prophetic Summa Technologi. But to really grok Lem, we have to go deeper than Lefham's typology, into Lem's experience of World War II, and how that experience told in his stories the truth of the Holocaust. Lem only of course an occupation of Poland and Ukraine, which was a blanket horrible, doesn't even begin to describe what it is. And so he lived for five years basically finding me. He has a novel called His Master's Voice, but there is a chapter in this novel which describes a massacre of Jews in uh, Lviv. And Lem was part of this massacre. I mean, he, what he describes this chapter is totally autobiographical. Again, for no reason. There was no reason for the massacre, obviously, and no reason to just let them go. And this chapter, if you want to understand the Holocaust and science fiction, you have to read this chapter. It describes what happens when people encounter the other, the alien, but instead of trying to interact with it in some way, they kill it. The history of Eastern Europe in the last hundred years gives you no faith in humanity. And so a lot of like, illusions of humanism, which which still inform so much of Anglo-American culture were lost in, in Eastern Europe a long time ago. Academic and LEM researcher Agnieszka Gajewska, in her book The Holocaust and the Stars, argues that enclosed in LEM's writing is his experience of the Holocaust, infused into narrative gaps, apparently functionless anecdotes, unexpected turns of events and grotesque visions. Lem's first novel was written under Soviet censorship that banned accounts of the Holocaust. The Hospital of Transfiguration instead depicts those who died in the occupation of Lviv as the abused patients of a mental asylum based on Lviv's Lazarus Hospital. In Among the Dead, 1949, Lem depicts the concentration camp Belzac, where many of his family were murdered. These early novels were written in the style of socialist realism, compulsory under communist censorship. But then Lem found a better way to say the unsayable in a totalitarian state, science fiction. The privileged passengers of an interstellar cruise witness the death of every soul aboard another starship, then with barely a word return to dancing in their decadent ballroom. 
This tale of Perks the Pilot, Lem's most famous character, is a metaphor for the privileged Western world, watching the extermination of Eastern Europeans, then going back to our pleasures. This theme emerges later in Lem's ambivalent relationship to American science fiction. The tales of Perks the Pilot also have their hero encounter a robot survivor of a starship disaster that killed the human crew. The robot carries the last memories of every human and is in constant suffering at their pain. It's hard not to see Lem's own struggles with survivor guilt in this metaphor, especially when the choice facing Perks the Pilot is whether to end the robot's life or leave it with the pain of its memories. It's because he feels that science is so much more profound. Science has the potential not just to open our minds, but to blow up our minds, to move us beyond what Nietzsche called human alter human. So at this point, those of us who only know Lem from this essay, which is a very serious essay about a very serious parts of Lem's life, are going to be thinking that Lem is a dour and serious writer. And sometimes he is. But more often, Lem is fuck ridiculous. Or to be accurate, fuck absurd. And in the best possible way. This is Ihon Tichi. Realm Pilot, a 2007 German adaptation of The Star Diaries. It's filmed in the lead actor's Berlin apartment, and frankly, it's the most accurate adaptation of Lem to the screen ever. Tarkovsky's Ponderous Solaris is the movie Lem is best known for in the Western world, but it represents only one aspect of Lem, the serious philosophical Lem. But Lem is more often a comical absurdist. I don't want to judge a man by his face, but Lem has the face of a funny man. But that humour has been turned black by trauma and experience. Turned to the absurd, there's a Lem who is a sci-fi cousin to Samuel Beckett and Eugene Ionesco, the absurdist playwrights, or to Albert Camus, the philosopher of the absurd. Humans are desperate for meaning, but we exist in a bleak, meaningless universe. So we play out dramas, fantasies, theatre and narratives, the pretense of meaning that are, in truth, nothing but absurd pantomimes. Buried in the absurdity of the Star Diaries is one of Lem's darkest and bleakest reflections on his Holocaust experience. Ihon Tichy's voyages bring him to a planet where robots have learned violence from humans and are violently killing off the humans who so educated them. The story ends with humans being selected for extermination, a scene directly from the concentration camps of World War II. His master's voice, 1968, is Stanislav Lem's greatest novel. It features many of Lem's patented narrative techniques. Peter Hogarth is a mathematician writing the memoir of his life. But that autobiography reflects on and is reshaped by the many biographies of Hogarth that Hogarth has also read. Hogarth, like all humans, is obsessed with finding the meaning of his life story. Hogarth is famous for leading a scientific research project into an alien message from the stars. Years of research fail to translate the message, but produce hundreds of possible but unverifiable meanings. His master's voice is a story about all the ways humans try to find meaning in the meaningless. His master's voice is also the book where Lem directly describes his experience of the Holocaust. The events in the Lviv prison yard are placed into the mouth of a scientist named Rappaport. But late in his life, Lem confided to his friends that these experiences were his own. There are two details of the Lem Rappaport story that can tell us much more about Lem. Lem Rappaport tries first to understand the Nazi SS officer overseeing the killing. This officer is described as a young deity of war. 
Lem describes every detail of the officer's uniform to show the incredible attention he has given to his costume. Because that's what this is, a stage scene in an absurd pantomime. While the common soldiers must dramatize their hate by beating their Jewish victims, the officer needs no such crutch. He believes so deeply in the pantomime, he has entirely vanquished any ideas that the Jews are real people, and as such can kill them with no emotion or conscience. Then, as his execution comes closer, Lem Rappaport concocts a fantasy that he will be reincarnated at the moment of his death into the being of the young Nazi officer. Lem isn't proposing this as a reality. It's an example of the human need to invent meaning, even when faced with the most absurd and meaningless events. Lem's best writing expresses this simple idea again and again. When faced with the alien ocean in Solaris, the human characters reimagine its manifestations as people they have loved. When trying to translate an alien message, we project any mistranslation that seems meaningful. Faced with our own violent death, we create a fantasy of eternal life. Humans aren't faced with an incomprehensible reality. We just don't like the reality we can comprehend. And so we dedicate ourselves to incomprehending the comprehensible. The character of Rappaport, in his master's voice, desperate for any insight into the alien message, resorts to reading science fiction. Not only does he find no help with the message, he discovers that science fiction has no meaning at all. Most science fiction is to authentic scientific, philosophical or theological knowledge, as pornography is to love. Stanislav Lem. But this was no friendly joke among sci-fi writers. Stanislav Lem deeply disliked American science fiction and was involved in a years-long feud with the science fiction writers of America. In brief, Lem was offered an accepted honorary membership of SFWA, which was then revoked. In principle, because Lem could join as a regular member, but in practice, because Lem is outrageously rude about American science fiction at every opportunity. Lem's acid dry humor focuses on statements of the kind made by Robert Heinlein that science fiction writers should remember they are in competition for readers' beer money. Lem responds that if science fiction has to compete with a beer bar showing international football, then science fiction is doomed. The Lem vs. SFWA feud is about something more than just the egos of writers. Although I highly recommend learning more about the human drama, which includes a showdown between Jerry Pornell and none less than Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, Lem sees in the SFWA the wealthy, delusional passengers aboard a starship who watch the deaths of others, then go back to dancing. In 1975, as the feud escalates, Lem is formulating his ethics of kitsch. Science fiction has the potential to be a mythology of technological civilization, but American sci-fi is just bad writing, wooden dialogue, and a self-satisfied ego trip. In the place of meaningful mythos is kitsch mystification. Lem has seen such kitsch mystification before. Nazi Germany, too, had indulged a kitsch fake myth of delusional fantasies and self-aggrandizing ego trips. Lem's ethics of kitsch will become central to his final understanding of the Holocaust, published in 1980 as his story, Provocation. We're told in the opening of Provocation that Horst Spernicus, the author's imaginary author, is a modern Copernicus, that the aim of his work is no less profound than removing the earth and man from the center of the universe. This is a reordering of man's moral universe, a new anthropology of evil. 
Provocation is the postmodern Lem number four, the Lem who writes invented reviews of non existent books. These include Gigamesh, reviewing a modernist rewrite of the ancient epic of Gilgamesh, Being Inc., reviewing a sci fi novel about a world where all human life is choreographed by a powerful AI, and The New Cosmogony, a review of a fictional oration by a Nobel Prize winning laureate who presents a new model of the universe based on his analysis of the Fermi paradox. These imaginary reviews allow Lem to analyse the most complex ideas. He can present in these super-dense texts a concept of his own imagination filtered through the mind of the imagined author and then reinterpreted back through Lem's own critical mind. In provocation, Lem is going to direct this technique at the darkest of all questions, the question of modern evil, as manifested in Nazism and the Holocaust, with the Copernican ambition of reordering our moral universe. But for him, the main issue was about human freedom to become more or different from human. He doesn't believe in the utopia but he did believe in the possibilities of human freedom, again, to become more than human. Journalism of Ian Tichy. And most of those stories are very funny, but he has one story in this collection, I think it's called The 28th Journey. And it's a vision of the world in which humanity has achieved total freedom to biologically modifying itself. Like, really talk freedom. Okay. You can live forever. You can create a body which is not even remotely human. You can uh, change your sex like every day of the week if you feel you can you can do whatever literally whatever you can possibly imagine. And the only supporters of like traditional humanism are robots. So robots are like keeping, you know, the flame of humanity alive. But when he comes to this planet, he can't even communicate with those creatures who neither physically nor, uh, you know, psychologically are human. So the whole uh, story, it's worth reading. It's this profound debate on what freedom really means and how far we can go. And the answer is we can go as far as we want because there is nothing in the world that stops us from becoming something else. And again, it's neither utopian nor dystopian. It's just a question mark. And it ends with, you know, the creed of humanism proclaimed by a Robert Monk. We, all of us, have been engaged in a decades-long denial of the Holocaust. At its most extreme, this is a denial of the actual events of the Holocaust. But the much more common form is to deny that the Holocaust was a part of modern reality. Horst Aspernicus dedicates much of Volume 1 to a methodical destruction of the common explanations for the Holocaust. These explanations of animal aggression or war and ethnic violence all frame the Holocaust as a thing from our past. But as Aspernicus Lem argue, the Holocaust is a specifically modern event. The violence and murder of the past at least had awful purpose. As Professor Alana Gomel writes in her essay on provocation, it is only in modernity that genocide comes into its own as a motiveless, purposeless act of extermination. The Holocaust is an event of our present and even more of our future. The murder of six million Jews wasn't caused by untamed evil from our past, but by a new form of evil emerging from modernity itself, from forces of modernity we are barely starting to comprehend. And as soon as we do comprehend them, we fast find ways to incomprehend them. Aspernicus Lem labels these forces under two categories, the ethics of evil and the ethics of kitsch. The ethics of evil is quite simply the understanding that the entire ideological apparatus of Nazism, to quote Professor Gomel, was nothing but a window dressing for the desire to kill. 
We have many ways of avoiding this realization. We talk about Nazism as nationalism or class struggle. We pretend the Nazis were genuinely deluded by an actual belief in their nonsense mystifications of Jews as an alien species. But the reality that we are desperate to incomprehend is just this. Humans like to humiliate, torture and kill other humans. Nazism was nothing but a theatrical justification for those dark desires. But that pleasure wasn't only the act of murder. It was murder for a higher cause, murder to serve a greater good, murder with meaning. The true pleasure is the act of violence that is justified by a transcendent purpose. Killing that makes us not killers, but saviors. To truly do bad things, people must believe they are doing good things. So the ethics of evil requires the invention of a transcendent purpose. And that requires the ethics of kitsch. I don't think I properly understood the argument presented by Stanislav Lem in Provocation or the Holocaust itself until my third reading of the story deep into the process of making this video essay and these lines. Hitler's conquest consisted in the careerism of lumpens, simpletons, non-commissioned officers' sons, bakers' assistants, and third-rate writers who longed for high position as salvation. The saturation of our culture with Nazi imagery can't help but impart a certain glamour on these symbols. The Hugo Boss uniforms, the eagles and iron crosses, the black and the red. So it's easy to forget that Nazism was a movement of the subpar and the semi-educated, a mob of mediocrity that had killed or forced into exile the talented and the skilled. When the narrow imagination of the Nazi mob turned to creating a mystification for itself to provide transcendent purpose for the desire to kill, what it made was a monstrous kitsch. A self-satisfied ego trip of bad art and recycled symbolism. What's horrifying about the Nazi officer burning bodies or the mob beating a mother and her daughter in the Lviv ghetto? I keep looking at this photograph to try and understand. Isn't that these are deities of war, but that these are very mediocre people indulging a cheap desire to humiliate and kill, covered over with a kitsch fantasy of meaning. And that this is the truth of the Holocaust. Stanislav Lem completes his warning against modern evil with an examination of how the ethics of evil and the ethics of kitsch are spreading through modern culture. The second volume of Genocide, Foreign Body Death, examines how modern terrorism replicates the Nazi ethics of evil. No doubt Lem would have recognized the kitsch mystification of young martyrs live streaming the deaths of entire families for a place in eternal paradise. But the death camps and terrorist attacks of the 20th century are only a foretaste of what the ethics of evil and the ethics of kitsch hold in store for us. What more is left to mankind in the field of these dark activities? What other games with death will he invent, sometimes veiled, sometimes exciting, with a bloody striptease? With this unanswered question ends A History of Genocide by Horst Aspernikus and Stanislav Lem's lifelong search for the truth of the Holocaust. Modern culture contains many people lost in the ethics of evil and the ethics of kitsch. Lem tells us that if you are only honest enough to comprehend this reality, you will see them clearly hiding behind their kitsch mystifications, looking for easy victims, just waiting for a provocation.